So we are welcome today to Zebra Spotlight with the one and only Patrick Hogan. Patrick is a multiple Emmy nominated uh, sound designer and filmmaker in, in his own right. And today we're joined by you in sunny Los Angeles and Sa San Fernando uh, Valley. San Fernando Valley, yes. And you're suburb in your... of Los Angeles. Yes, and you're in your backyard and it is what, 39 degrees? Uh, 39 degrees Celsius. Oh, it just jumped. Uh, now it's about 39.5. Wow. We'll probably hit 40. And you haven't yeah. even broken a sweat. So how cool are you? It's it's a dry heat. <laughs> We're in the <laughs> desert and I'm in the shade. I have, I have an wow. umbrella over me to, to keep um, me uh, feeling good. It's an honor to actually podcast with you. Um, you know, thank you very much for your Q&A before. So if people want to head over to the uh, website, they can read your more informative Q&A. Um, but this is absolutely fantastic. Um, and straight after this podcast, you're going to be attending the uh, the premiere for the latest season of Cobra Kai. Yes, that's correct. Season five, uh, uh, begin, it airs, or, or nowadays we say drops, right? Because it's streaming. It drops on Friday, this Friday in two days from when we're recording this. And tonight in a uh, park in uh, downtown Los Angeles, which is very, very nice, they're having the premiere um, which is really fun because it's obviously everybody who worked on the show will be there who can make it. But they also, because they're doing it in this outdoor venue, screening down on a big outdoor screen, um, they had limited tickets to give out to fans. So um, it's, you know, oftentimes these premieres are just the people who worked on it. But what's mm -hmm. fun is they're opening it up to some of the diehard fans. And I think the tickets sold out in like, you know, five minutes. I know so many people found out about it. By the time they found out about it, it was too late. Well, why am so, I not surprised? I mean, this is... Uh, should be uh, fun. It's going to be awesome. Um, now, before we go, go on to talk about Cobra Kai, um, let's delve into your uh, prowess as a, as a filmmaker. Uh, first of all, congratulations on um, Thank you. your short film, Killing Time, which has won multiple awards. And uh, you, as I said, you very kindly sent me the Blu-ray of that. So I managed to watch that before with this podcast. So tell me about your exploits in, in filmmaking yourself. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm old enough that I'm of that Star Wars generation. I was one of those little kids who lined up, dragged their, made their parents take them to see Star Wars as a little kid. So I've always been uh, fascinated with filmmaking. And, and then I got into writing and then, uh, in high school, I did some theatrical productions and, and all that kind of morphed into me wanting to to make films, uh, which eventually led me uh, to come here to uh, LA and go to film school. And so um, in sound, you have people who come into sound from different disciplines beforehand. Obviously, uh, music is usually the, the number one road. Uh, you know, a lot of people I work with are either musicians or sound engineers for recording studios or live music, and they kind of found their way into sound post-production. Uh, and then some of us come from other backgrounds. And in my case, I was a filmmaker who realized that, you know, between making my own projects, I still need to find a way to make a living, right? <laughs> and try to get healthcare and, uh, you know, take care of my family. And um, I had worked in uh, radio in high school, uh, DJ. And um, I'd done some, some very basic rudimentary uh, sound editing then, making commercials and, and bumpers for the radio station. So uh, in film school, I kind of fell into the sound department. And one thing led to another. And before I even graduated, I was getting uh, paid offers to do sound on projects. And I thought, wow, I haven't even graduated yet. I'm making money. This is pretty nice. Uh, and, so, and so I got into sound. But at the same time, I still continue to make my own films. And what I love is while everybody would love to make the film that is a huge box office success and, and, and earns, you know, gazillion dollars, what's nice is, is my success as a sound editor uh, in sound post-production has given me the opportunities to make my own films. Uh, it provides me the time between projects and gives me the connections and the knowledge that I need to make my own projects where I'm the boss and I, everything, <laughs> I get final say on my project, which is great. So uh, I get to do those projects and, you know, and, and the next one might be a little bit bigger. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. We're working on some new things, but you know, it's, it's, it's nice to kind of keep that, that creativity going 
Uh, and I think it helps me as a sound editor because since I've been on the opposite side of the table, so to speak, when I'm talking to my clients, I know where they're coming from. And I think it helps me get to what they need faster because I can speak the language of someone who either wrote or directed or produced whatever the project is. I kind of can, I think, better understand what they're trying to get when I'm a sound editor. So I also think that my, my filmmaking has helped me uh, as a sound editor in the same way that I think any filmmaker learning the other disciplines, um, I think, you know, the directors and producers I've worked with who really understand sound have better sound for their shows because they can speak the language and they kind of know what I'm doing and that allows them to help me understand what they want that much quicker. That's, that's interesting. Most recently I did a podcast with Mark Mangini. Um, he yeah. was expressing the exact same thing that what you just hit on, that when a director um, understands the importance of sound telling their story, overall the, the production value just just suddenly soars through the roof and, and they prioritize sound as being an essential element of the whole storytelling of the of film or TV production. It's not just about the the actors and the narrative. The sound is actually one of the major actors in, in the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. No, and Mark's I used my office used to be three doors down from him when we worked wow, for the okay. same company. And I would sit and talk with him and it's like, wow, my boy, I you know, he's forgotten more about sound than I'll ever know. You know, I mean like he he's He's the, you know, he's the Spielberg of, you know, sound editorial, you know what I mean? Uh, so uh, the fact that I'm saying some of the things, it makes me feel good because I respect him so much. So that's, that's good to hear. And it's interesting, as you mentioned before, a lot of the people that I've interviewed um, in from the sound team, predominantly, yes, they come from a musical background. So either they play instruments or they had a very early influences of playing music or being from a, um, a musical family. Um, and so when you have dialogue with some of your colleagues who've been working in sound for, for years, who've come from that background, what were the sort of, um, I mean, did, did you think, did they treat you in the same sort of manner as, as yes, he, he's sort of developed into one of us, or has there always been that uh, slight divide that, yeah, you, you know, you, you're not no, from the same yeah. background? No, there's, there's no divide. I mean. What's great, and it's I think it's not just uh, unique to to sound. I think it's um, um, anything in filmmaking. You know, there's different ways to to get. You know, some people go an academic route and have degrees. Um, I'm I'm one of those people. Some people never go to school. They weren't good at school, and they just you know dropped out of high school and started like you know ripping on little films because they needed someone who was strong and could push uh, some heavy equipment around um, and worked their way up. So what's what's really great is it's it's not, you know, it's not like in some other professions where it's very rare to have someone who comes from a different route. You know, usually, you know, it's it's like, you know, I can see if you like if you go to see a heart surgeon, you say, well, what school did you go to for heart surgeon? He goes, oh, you know, I'm just self-taught. I just kind of, you know, just I just kind of hung out in the surgery in the room and watched them do the work. You know, like I can see then you're like, oh, oh, oh you know, but um, in film, it's all about the work, and if you can do the work. That's where the, the respect or, or, or you know, I wouldn't say lack of respect, but people will get nervous about you if they see that you can't do the work. But if you can do the work, that's what matters. If you can do the work and if you can be a nice person and easy to get along with while you're doing it, then people will hire you. And it doesn't matter whether you have a diploma on your wall, whether you can play the keyboard, whether you know how to compose a song or whether you wouldn't know, you know, uh, any, if you don't know anything about music whatsoever. Um, all that matters is, you know, can you do the job and are you, you know, are you nice to get along with? I would say being nice to get along with is more important than anything else. In a competitive business like we're in, uh, you know, it's just too crazy to work with people that, that aren't nice to work with. So what's great is, is I work with nice people. It's all, they're, they're all nice people. The people who can't get along with others and can't play nice end up going somewhere else and doing something else because this is, you know, this is too competitive to, to deal with that. So, so no, the, um, not really. Every once in a while, I might say a film schooly filmmaker kind of word. And they'll, you know, if I throw out, uh, does this sound diegetic or non diegetic? They'll look at me like, wait, I'll say score or source. And they go, oh, okay. Yeah. So sometimes, sometimes you can throw out those academic words that you wrote about in your papers in film school. Uh, and and the, the people who come from music backgrounds will look at you like, what are you talking about? Um, 
uh, but no, it's, it's, everybody gets along really well. I work with, I've worked with people, some of the people I'm working with right now, the mixer and the dialogue editor on the show I'm doing reservation dogs. Uh, I've worked with the dialogue editor for 23 years. In fact, wow. he was a dialogue editor when I came on as an assistant. And when I cut a reel to prove that I could do the job, he was the one who reviewed my work and said, yeah, Patrick's ready to step up. And now 23 years later, he's helping me out on my show and he's cutting the dialogue for me, which is great because I know he's awesome because I literally learned from him. So, you know, uh, these relationships uh, end up lasting a long time. I, I love the the mutual respect and the sort of mentorship attitude that all of you seem to have um, for, from a layman's perspective. And, and, you know, again, through naivety, one would imagine, or if you work in Hollywood, it's sort of a doggy dog type industry and, and it's who you know and who you sort of suck up to. But I think it's reassuring, particularly for people wanting to get into the film the industry, that look, if you work hard and you respect individuals, and as you said, you're easy to get along with, that's, that has a lot of longevity in it. And it really is about celebrating your creative talent and, and supporting each other. Yeah. I mean, yes, it's, a, it's, it's dog eat dog in that you're working at the highest levels of, of the job. And in some ways, TV is even more demanding than feature. I'm um, not not that not that you know you're, you're it's kind of apples and oranges, but but there's a a speed at which you have to work in TV mm -hmm. that can throw someone off who's used to working only in features. So it's it is very competitive, and there's a lot of people who want to do it. But because of that, character and dependability and work ethic become that much more important. Uh, because it's not just talent. Um, you know, I always say what I do on the stage and what I do prepping for a show isn't anything that hundreds of other people can't do. You know, there are a lot of people in this town who could deliver the same end product that I do, right? Everybody's really talented. So I think what I pride myself in is one, having the, the, the ability to, to kind of speak the filmmaker's language and help them get what they want quicker. And having the experience that I have working with actors to get good ADR. Um, and, uh, you know, just the, the experience of understanding what will happen on the stage a couple of times this past season on Cobra Kai and Umbrella Academy, which is the same mixer with Joe. There are a couple of times where he would say, oh, you know what? I'm having a problem with blah, blah, blah. Do you think you can give me a fix? And I'll say, it's already on the server. Because a while back, I heard what he was struggling with, and I go, oh, you know, he might need something there. And so in the background, I've been trying to do that. Um, not to show off or anything, but it's literally just time is money on a stage and money's time. And the faster I can get him what he needs, the more time we have to work with it and be prepared uh, to play it for the client and have mm -hmm. them love what we've done. So it's those things. And then just being a nice person that people want to, you know, that people want to work with. Like I said, um, those those things go uh matter much more and go and will take you much further in your career mm -hmm. than you know going to the best film school or uh you know having you know if you worked on a big giant film that got you a ton of publicity but then when i talk to the supervisor of that show and say how was it working with you know so and so uh, i'm thinking of, of using them and they go well you know their stuff was always late and it sounded great but it was tough to get it from on time stuff well that's you know a red flag and that might um uh, hurt your chances of, of getting hired by other people because especially in tv like i said there's 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 no time for delays uh you know if if if, it's, if the stage is going on thursday you've got to have your stuff ready on thursday you know even if uh even if we have last minute changes on tuesday you got to be prepared to you know you don't know we're the last step really in the process which means they've already spent a lot of time on delays mm -hmm. so by the time they get to us usually there's no more time uh, to, to push it even further. So more often than not, we're working on a very, very strict time budget. And so sometimes you have to cancel plans and miss things. That's the unfortunate side of it, which mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. why I think it's important to, when you take time off, it's important to really take time off um, and step away. But when you commit to a show, you have to understand that you're committing, or if you're doing a, a movie, you know, when you commit to that movie, whatever that time frame is, you have to kind of realize, you know, I'm committing to this and there's an op there's a good chance that things that mm -hmm. fall within that time frame, I'm going to have to cancel just because that's the nature of the business. I, I think on behalf of the consumers who are uh, um, fans of, of popular TV series, it's that 
well, we've just finished one season, right? When's the next one coming? Come on, guys. <laughs> we've just finished, but yeah. we want the next one like next month. And I, I guess you know people don't appreciate that the 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 amount of time and the effort it takes. Um, uh, people just want things on demand. Uh, you know, ASAP they just can't get enough of it. Um, yeah. You mentioned ADR, so luckily we managed to do this podcast a little bit earlier than schedule because two of the actors didn't turn up for their ADR recording. Um, yeah. Just from a, a layman's perspective, when you're recording a scene and there's dialogue, um, just explain sort of in simple terms to, to people who may not quite, quite understand um, how 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 we then capture the audio to make it sound clear and how do you sync it so it looks like they're actually talking with, with a boom or something rather than yeah. uh, playing back a recording that was done afterwards. How, how does the whole process yeah. work? How do you convince us? It's a, it's a lot of work and it takes various people who are very skilled at what they do. Um, so ADR stands for automated dialogue replacement, which is funny because there's really nothing automated about it. Uh, it's also referred to as looping. And both of those terms came from the early days where the way they used to record it was they would, it was on film and they would take a loop. They would take the piece of the scene that they needed to re-record the audio and they would literally loop that piece of film and play it in the projector. So it would be, you know, if it's, uh, let's see, Council Black, here's looking at you, kid, right? So be, here's looking at you, kid. Here's looking at you, kid. Here's looking at you, kid. And then the actor could sit in front of the stage and see that piece of looped film playing. And then they, they would start recording on a new piece of film and the actor would go, here's looking at you, kid. Here's looking at you, kid. And then in the, on the flatbed, they would take that new piece of film and line it up on the flatbed so that the new line is in sync with the original line. So that's why it's called looping. It goes right. way, way back. Well, we don't use film anymore. We don't use tapes anymore. It's all hard drives and it's X's and O's on a computer. Uh, but we still do the same thing. So, so ADR today means any dialogue uh, that was recorded after the fact, not on set. So anything that was recorded on set is is production sound, we, production dialogue, and it's edited by a, what we call a dialogue editor. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily always dialogue. There might be things that were recorded on set that aren't actual dialogue that get used in the show. But we, we call the person the dialogue editor because 90% of what they're cutting is the dialogue on, on set. And then for various reasons, they might need to either record new dialogue or re-record what was on set. If a jet plane flies overhead right as the actor is saying a line and the film takes place in 50 BC during the Roman Empire, uh, you can't have a jet plane, you know, flying over it, right? That doesn't work. Um, sometimes we, we now have new digital tools that we can clean up a lot. But certain things you just can't get rid of. If I'm standing next to train tracks and when you're shooting my angle, there's no train behind me, but then when they cut to your angle and we don't see the train, but there's a train in the background, like we can't fix that. We can't solve it. So uh, you either add train to the other angle to make both of them the same amount of noisiness, or you have to replace that line that had the train noise on it. So that's the, the number one thing that ADR has done for is to fix all of the sound you know any, any any action film where you see the people and there's the wind machine mm -hmm. uh blowing air on them those things are really loud and you're never hearing the actual sound that's on set because it's not usable uh nowadays with drones drones are actually very loud so whenever mm -hmm. you see any shots of someone and they're talking and you're seeing a drones you know like the camera comes swooshing in and they're flying away those drones have this very loud pitched whine and so we yes. can't use that sound so ADR is, is primarily used to fix those technical issues. Then, then the other thing would be um, new dialogue. Sometimes in editing, they decide that a piece of information wasn't explained properly or the audience is confused by something. And so maybe they have to write a new line that explains something. And so what they'll do is they'll be on the other person's face and the other person will be going, you know, get a reaction shot and we'll now put in that new right. piece of information from the actor we're not seeing on screen or we'll be on the back of their head or we cut away to them picking up a glass or, you know, things like that. So there's those new, new lines. Sometimes they have to trim stuff for, for running time, especially in TV, you've got to cut out a scene and you cut out that scene, but there was one tiny little piece of information that was very important in that scene. And without it, you won't understand the story. So in the scene before, or after that, they come up with a way to add 
one line of ADR that helps explain, you know, what what that was. Um, so those kind of things. Sometimes you have an actor who's you know English, uh, but playing an American, or is an American and is playing an Australian. Um, I've been helping out on a show coming out on Netflix later this fall called Chanteram, which is an international show, and we have uh, a guy from England who's playing an Australian. We have a guy from Australia who's playing an Indian. We have, you know, it's like, you know, everybody's doing different accents. Uh, we have a woman from Sweden who's playing an American. So they study with that coach and they do an amazing job, but every once in a while, one word trips them up. Uh, and when, when, you know, uh, and so then we do an ADR. So they can come in and they can say it multiple times. They'll have a dialect coach. They can figure out the correct pronunciation and then we can get it so that you can't tell that they were, you know, not speaking in their, their native accent. So um, as far as how it's done, the actor comes to a stage. One of the things that's a big misconception uh, is that, and we have this problem when we have to go to stages that don't typically do ADR, when we go to music stages, is that the idea is not to get the most pristine and beautiful sound. We're not trying to get a voiceover like you'd have for a commercial or even the voiceover in a movie. We're not, we don't want to use the, you know, the, the Neumann U87 is kind of like the gold standard of voiceover mics mm -hmm. and, and we use a lot of vocals. We don't want to use that mic. What we want is to match the sound that was recorded on set. So typically what we do is the ADR stage usually has one of the same shotgun or hypercardioid uh, condenser mics that are used, they're the, the ones most often used on set. And it's mm -hmm. positioned up and away the same place it would be boomed on set. And then we also take a lavalier mic and we clip it onto their shirt. And on some places on our stages at Formosa Group, we actually don't even wire the mic hardwired into the board. We actually have it on a uh, uh, wireless pack and we transmit it wirelessly to the board the same way on set it's wireless so that it matches. So the idea is that we want the sound to match exactly. So a lav mic out here is going to sound very different from when it's mm -hmm. sitting on your chest. And that signal path, when it gets digitized through a wireless system, sounds a little bit different than when it goes through um, a hard wire. So the idea is you want to match as closely as possible the acoustics that you're um, replacing. If the actor is interior, we might have them get off, back off the mic a little bit because inside you're hearing a little bit of the room on the recording. So we'll have mm -hmm. them stand a little bit further back from the mic so that what the, the ADR is kind of matching. If they're exterior, we'll have them get very close to the mic because we don't want to hear any of the ADR room because when you're outside like I am, you're not hearing the uh, reflections off walls mm -hmm. and things like that. So um, a lot of time in the ADR, and that's where great, you know, good ADR mixer is so important. That's the first, you know, that's the first step in getting good matching ADR is making sure that you're matching um, it isn't that we can't take better recorded sound and match it, but it takes a lot of time on the stage to EQ and provide the and 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 do the things that are necessary, and and it's, it becomes really hard if an ADR has room on it. It becomes it's it's easier to to degrade than to improve a signal. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. if you already have there are D reverb and plugins that you can use, but they never sound quite as good, and it takes time. And again, time is the enemy on the stage because you have limited time. To get it mixed so the air mixer does that and then the other really important thing is the actor the actor has to match the timbre of their voice over the course of a day your voice actually drops a little bit and as your vocal cords warm up and then wear out over the day so in the morning you might be at a higher tone and at the end of the day it might be a little lower if the actor was in scenes where they were yelling and screaming before that particular scene their voice might have a coarse or roughness to it that they don't have when they come in four weeks later and they've just come off a two week vacation and they're all rested and they they're feeling good and it's now eight in the morning and you know so working with the actor to get their voice to match is is really important and of course the, the most important thing of all is performance if the performance doesn't match if the actor isn't in the same uh uh, uh timber of voice and with the same emotion and the same intensity um you can tell that and there's no we, you know, you can't EQ performance. We always joke if there was a performance button on the board, whoever made that would be a billionaire. There is none. So, and that's where, where I come in and, and are and the good directors and producers as well is working with the actor to help them because oftentimes the actor, you know, I did ADR with an actor and he was, he was doing ADR for a scene 
when they filmed it, he was dying and he's sitting down in the snow in front of a car and it's at nighttime. And so when they filmed it, he couldn't see anybody else. It was just lights and it was dark and he was cold and he'd been filming all day and he was tired. And, you know, it just had the, the way he delivered the lines and the tone of his voice had this defeated, I'm ready to die, you know, tone to it. You know, he came in eight hours, it's 9 a.m. He just had a Starbucks, you know, he has coffee, you know, <laughs> and he's in this tiny little room. It's air conditioned, perfect temperature, very comfortable. And then we, you know, and so we actually worked with him for a while and, and, and kind of made him do multiple takes. And we kind of wore him out in the session to get him to be as tired as he was when he felt, you know, things like that to kind of match, you know, it, they're not in the costume. They're not acting against the other person who's right in their face, yelling back at them, you know, all those things. Um, so it, sometimes, you know, some actors are really great at it. Some actors have to work at it. And I love actors who work hard and want to do a good job um, and put in the effort to make sure that they match those things. Because again, we could have the, 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 the mic, can, it can be the right mic, they can be the right distance from the mic. They can have the right EQ on it. Um, it can be in the right timber of their voice. But if the performance isn't matching, the audience is still going to go, oh, they're, you know, they may not go, oh, that was ADR, but they'll go, oh, something was, something was off there. I think everybody's had that experience watching the film. And they're like, they know that that dialogue they're hearing wasn't spoken in that moment. And they don't know why. Um, and it can be as little as if they make the actor yell a little bit more than what they did on the set. You can tell just by not seeing the vocal cords in the neck stretch and the mouth open. It could be in perfect syncing. You'd be like, no, that, that's not right. Well, yeah, because you know what it looks like when someone yells versus when someone talks softly. Um, wow. So we have to so take all those things into account. It, it, incredibly technical. And in fact, um, as you mentioned before, that's an intense amount of work on, on everyone just to convince us. But you guys do an amazing job. Um, Let's let's come on to your short film, your award-winning short film, uh, Killing Time. Um, now, I, I, I didn't know what to expect. So recently I've been watching Stranger Things and, and I'll be honest, it, a lot of it just freaked me out. And I remember saying to you that, I know this yeah. is a thriller, <laughs> but is this gonna freak me out? Is it a horror film? I wasn't sure what to expect. And thankfully you, you, you sort of, um, um, you said, you know, rest assured it, it, it's, it's not terribly freaky, but there's a few mom jumpy moments. Um, so when I started watching it, I, I've got to say that, that uh, I, you know, I'm not going to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but um, certainly the, the opening shots, uh, I, I felt like this is a, a huge production uh, and it reminded me, it gave me lots of vibe to do with Ozark uh, and then um, maybe certain, um, um, something sinister, something similar to Halloween um, to, uh, but the, but the from a from a short film perspective, I and you've shot it in two thirty nine um, framing, cinema yeah. scope. So you know I'm watching it on a two thirty nine screen, um, and it looked fabulous. The cinematography was superb, um, but the the audio levels and when we talk about audio telling a story, I mean the bass levels were intense, and I thought, whoa, this is yeah. yes, this is rocking, and I thought, okay, this is brilliant. My my dual twelve inch subs have just come alive. Uh, it was it was wonderful, a great film to watch, um, very unpredictable. So you know, congratulations on, on making a, a a brilliant film. Thank um, you. I wish everyone had dual twelve inch subs who watched it, then they'd really <laughs> experience it the way it's. Uh, no, I, it just it was just a surprise. And when it happened, I thought, whoa, okay, this is someone's been having fun <laughs> in the mixing room. And interestingly, it was your friend uh, Frank Marone who. Uh, was part of the the, the post-production audio mix yeah so at the time I was finishing the film uh, you know so the, the film was basically just made it was kind of at the peak part of the pandemic mm -hmm. the, the lockdowns had just kind of eased up but everything was still kind of shut down so none of us were working and we th I thought perfect time to try to make the film and I had a script I was going to shoot um, right before the pandemic a short film and it was the same general idea. The twist is kind of similar, uh, except instead of a a mother and daughter, it's a uh, it's a couple. It's a husband and wife. Um, but that script had scenes that took place in a store and on public streets and lots of people. And so I thought I have to. It was it was it used the killing time uses the tropes of horror 
to kind of set you up for one thing. And then of course it, it gives you a, a surprise, which we won't spoil. Mm -hmm. um, the original script was like a film noir kind of vibe. And then that same twist. So when I thought to convert it to do something during the pandemic, I was like, well, SAG requires that all actors stay six feet apart if they're unmasked. And we can't have a lot of extras or background people. And I thought, you know, the horror trope plays perfectly to that because the person alone in their house is such the classic, you know, and, uh, you know, so Halloween was definitely the inspiration for this. Right. I was like, what if we started and it was like Halloween? <laughs> and so I, re I reconfigured the story to be about a about a mother and her daughter and then um i i added the father character which was became a really cool role to replace basically all the voiceover because the noir version had voiceover which was a you know a trope of the film noir um and then i was like uh, i also the reason i changed it to mother daughter was well you know it's weird if a couple stays far apart but it makes total sense that a daughter would just poke her head in the door and talk to her mom and like you you, you don't get up close and put your arm around you know what i mean uh it makes sense that a daughter would just like poke her head in the room yell at her mom and then leave right so i was like okay perfect we don't you know that that allows us to follow all the all, all the rules if you notice that none of the characters always stay they, they're always on opposite sides of that desk except for one character and there's a reason why that character was able to get close uh, and still follow the COVID rules, but we won't spoil that. Um, so it was, a, it was a kind of, a, I think, a clever way to to make it work in those beginning stages of being allowed to work together, but still following all the, the rules and protocols. And then, of course, everybody was masked and tested, and we, you know, we did all that stuff. But it was, it, we, we didn't have a budget. It was just uh, friends. Uh, the DP is actually a director, the husband of the lead actress, and he has a bunch of gear, and I have a bunch of gear. Uh, and the house, the grand, the father, grandfather, that's his actual house that we filmed at. Wow, so it was okay. literally just, uh, it was just some friends and family. We got together for a weekend and we did it. And as when we were in post, I was mixing Roswell, New Mexico with Frank Marone and Rob Carr. And I mentioned this to them. And I actually was going to see if the mix tech on the stage wanted to do it because I wasn't going to bother them, of course, with it. And they were like, hey, if we have a day off, we'd love to help you out mix the film and I was like oh that would be fantastic so once I locked picture and cut the dialogue uh Frank took that home and pre-dubbed it on his home he has you know his home system is better than most professional <laughs> studios he went home and pre-dubbed the dialogue and then on another day when we weren't working on Roswell I came to the stage and Rob came, Rob came in and, and the three of us uh uh mixed it uh in one day with Frank, you know, doing the dialogue and music and then Rob doing the sound effects and Foley. So it was really cool to have them because, you know, it, it made it easy because I just told them what I wanted and then just, you know, let them do it. Like, you know. I think it's just a wonderful celebration of talent and, and collaboration at a, at a very testing time. The, the elements of um, uh, of making Killing Time. And one, one of the things that struck me was the uh, extraordinary cinematography. And you were mentioning that obviously your friends have got Kit. Um, but it, it was very cinematic. And when I first think of a short film, immediately I think that this is a 69 frame, three to four minute thing with some sort of tail at the end of it shot for YouTube um, or um, uh, you know one, one of the other, like VMO, something like that. But so it was a great surprise when I put it up on the screen. I thought, whoa, I need to put the big screen on because this is shot like a, a, a theatrical movie. Yeah, we, I mean, we did that. We did that intentionally to give it that theatrical uh, feel because we knew that, you know, I knew that the opening would have a lot of big cinematic moments, but I also knew that the majority of the story, because of the conditions we were from under, was going to be in a very constrained environment. And so my thought was, you know, well, let's let's shoot it in in widescreen uh, in two three nine, and let's give it that feel um, of of a big theatrical motion picture like we you know uh, the, the idea was let's make a short film that it could easily look like it's just any 10 to 15 minute portion of a big budget theatrical film um, we did the same thing with virtually actually virtually was a, a different cinematographer um, but it was the same feel uh, virtually had a lot more it was a bigger budget thing uh, shot pre-pandemic and we had uh, a lot more you know cinematic shots in it uh, 
but same thing. We just wanted it to feel like you were seeing a piece of a movie. And to me, cinema, the big widescreen cinema, just psychologically makes you feel like you're seeing an event. And so I felt that, you know, even though the majority of people will be watching at home, having it be in that widescreen format will just give it that sense of scale that would kind of help combat the fact that it was actually a very modest production. I think you hit the nail on the head. But as soon as I, um, uh, when I fired it up, I didn't know what frame it was. So when I saw it on the, the OLED television, as soon as I saw the black bars, I paused it, thought, told the family, listen, you'll have to wait. You need to put the projector on and get the cinema screen <laughs> down to watch this the way it was designed to be watched. So it was a fantastic celebrating it in, in the home theater. I'm glad. And you know, and, and the, the great thing is, and, and I think I said this before I talked to you, is, is we appreciate you and what your company does so much and your, your clients and your customers and your friends, because that's, that's who we make the movies for. I mean, there's a lot of discussions all the time about why do we color grade on a $20,000 calibrated monitor and why do we mix in 5.1 or in Dolby Atmos in, you know, in, a, in a calibrated stage with uh, you know, large amplified speakers? Uh, why do we do all these things when a lot of people are going to watch it on their iPad that's set down to a very dim level you know, playing through the one mono speaker on an iPad. We get that. That's how a lot of people watch stuff now. That's how my kids watch a lot of stuff. And we could, you know, we could mix and color the film and, and, and film it to all that for that purpose. But, you know, we decided that, um, you know, we wanted to, you know, we always do the work to the highest level. So the people who do take the time and money to view it that way will get that. We don't want to shortchange them knowing that then a lot of the people who hear it wasn't aren't going to see the details that that those people see but it's there for those people who who really want to get the best experience uh, and coming from not only a seller of high-end audio but foremost a consumer and avid fan of fantastic television productions and movies i can honestly say we really appreciate it um so That's when great. we're watching um you know the latest season of cobra kai mixed in dolby atmos and um it it's just exhilarating to watch it with the volume turned up and hearing all the, the nuances and the crash bang wallop of, of the action sequences. I mean, that, that that's what makes me excited. And coming on to which, um, you know, congratulations, congratulations again for being nominated. Um, Thank you. Um, the hearts are all over the globe on your work for Cobra Kai. Um, everyone's extremely excited to, uh, to watch the, uh, the latest season on Friday. Um, the the audio effects on there incredible. I mean, you know, the, just it's just brilliant, um, and it, it's it's so exciting to watch. It's such good fun. Um, what are the uh, obviously without spilling the beans, but are there any new things which you guys have applied on this season compared to the other ones to really um, make us go nuts? Well. I won't give any spoilers away, but let's say the new thing that's been added this season in some of the fight scenes is uh, things that might make metallic shing sounds and wow. sounds okay. when you fight. Uh, so maybe we, we have some of that. We also have, uh, and this is in the trailer, but there are some new senseis that come to town because mm -hmm. Terry Silver has big plans. So we have even more uh, training and fight scenes with some really skilled uh, martial artists. Some of the, uh, I don't think it's been revealed yet, but some of the, the senseis are actual uh, highly skilled MMA and martial artists. Um, one in particular, I, I don't think I can name him yet. I don't know if that's been revealed, but, but there's someone who is an actual uh, uh, high-end MMA fighter who plays one of the the, ex, the new senseis. So we had wow. a lot of really cool, you know, scenes where we had these really great, um, uh, you know, and some of some of the new senseis are are stunt performers, you know, stunt actors. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, and then yeah, yeah, there might be some fighting with with things that make shing sounds and are very sharp. If you know what I mean. <laughs> we absolutely look forward. Terry to that. Silver makes everything. 
raises the bar across across the, the whole course, spectrum. Of course, wouldn't expect anything nice. I mean, the, the trailer looks brilliant. Uh, I watched the trailer and thought, okay, this is this is just going on a completely different level. Um, you know, I, I guess very similar to you know when you watch the Rocky series. Um, obviously, watching yeah. it after such a long time, Creed really brought everything into the 21st century, just in terms of everything from from the sound design to the music selection. You know. You can tell that all the the ingredients are there, and of course, you know, Sylvester Stallone's playing Rocky Balboa. We, we you know exactly which era you're in, and and you know everything, the culture and everything goes with it. I guess it's very very similar in, in sort of Cobra Kai land um, in terms of the origins to the use of technology and where we are now, and how yeah. the production value reflects that. Yeah, yeah, it's it it is it. it definitely like i said I, I said this i think in the prior interview and i've said other ones you know we we listen to the karate kid movies and we use that as the basis for what we do in the sound the same way they used it for the basis for the show but then we also recognize that that was 1984 and we're now you know 30 some years in the you know past that so while we pay homage to the sound design and the way they do things we do modernize it because this is in many ways a lot of the stories in the show are the the next generation right the next uh generation of kids um but uh um it's been so much fun and and I, I will say also you know what's great is you know characters always come back you know characters that you may have loved in seasons one or two that you haven't seen for a while you know they might make appearances um and yuji who plays chosen first of all, he's a great guy he's a super nice guy but he's so talented because you know you saw him in that movie he was kind of like a one-note villain right mm -hmm. and now this season you know He's going to make you laugh. He's going to make you cry. He's going to, you know, he's he's going to show off his true talents that you maybe didn't get to see, you know, when he was just the villain. And and there's a lot of callbacks uh, to both Karate Kid 2 and Karate Kid 3. So uh, that's um, that was a lot of fun. And then and then, like I said, the sound, you know, the sound is always challenging. You know, people don't realize, you know, Cobra Kai is is a low budget show by by you know prime time you know tv standards you know it started on on youtube um mm -hmm. uh with kind of a shoestring budget and have done like incredible things uh with that budget and it has increased but you know the fact is that i think one of the reasons netflix loves to show much so much is it isn't a show that breaks the bank right like the the guys it's the you know john hayden and josh they they do amazing stuff with the budget they have and you see the action set pieces and then the things we come up with on the stage, you know, they're, they're things that you don't usually see in a show like this. You know, it's kind of like, you know, to, it's kind of like the budget of like saved by the bell, but with the, you know, with the action of, you know, some huge, you know, eighties Sylvester Stallone or Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know, action movie uh, rolled into it. Right. So, um, you know, that's, that's been a lot of fun and, mm -hmm. and see, and, you know, every season there's different challenges in the fights this time around, we have uh, uh, a couple occasions where, where there are multiple fights going on at one time and we're cutting from location to location. And so it gets even more complex because one fight ha will have certain sonic characteristics, the other fight has the other one, but we, they're happening simultaneously. So we're having, we're cutting back and forth between all these different things. And of course, uh, the music, which is always so amazing, is is big. So the balance of the music versus the sound effects versus all the yelling and uh, efforts and and dialogue, it's all going on at the same time. You know, there are a couple points in the season that are pretty crazy big, which of course the fans always, you know, they expect that, right? Every year we got to wow them with something, so we have it again. Don't don't worry, it's not going to end with you know, it's not going to end with thirty minutes of someone you know having a quiet conversation on the couch. It goes, you know, Cobra Kai shows no mercy. Wow, absolutely. And, and the interesting thing is, obviously, you know, looking back on previous seasons, there's always this thing about, you know, how are we going to entertain or, or not just entertain, but how are we going to make the crowd's jaws gape open? You know, what are we going to do this time? How early in the production of, of a new season do, do you get involved with, with, say, some of the actors or the producers or the director? is the collaboration right from the beginning and particularly as a filmmaker do you get involved very very early on uh so you know because of the 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 like again it's it's the, the budgets are tight time is tight part of what's great about the show is i've been with it from the very beginning 
So nowadays it's a lot of shorthand. I don't have to ask as many questions and I kind of already know what they're going to want. But every season, anything that's new or unique, um, they will reach out to me ahead of time and we'll discuss. A um, couple of things I don't want to talk about the things for season five because they, they, you know I don't want to spoil the new unique things. Mm -hmm. But for instance, in season four, that was the first time where they started doing all of the, the slow-mo speed ramps on the fight scene. So if you if you recall in the final episode mm -hmm. when they have the big epic uh, fight, they do what's called speed ramping, which is where it might start at normal speed. And then as the camera pushes in on them and they go to strike each other, it suddenly goes into slow motion. Or it might start in slow motion. And then as we push in on them, it suddenly goes to normal speed. Well, the way they do that is they actually record all of the footage at three times slow motion so that when they play it back in slow motion, it's still full resolution mm -hmm. uh, and smooth. And then when it's at regular speed, they're actually playing the footage back three times faster. Um, right. But but that does create problems with syncing the sound. So when they decided they were going to do that, they got they reached out to me ahead of time, and we talked through how they were going to do it. And then I did a couple tests to make sure that we would be to make sure that we wouldn't lose. We wanted to make sure that all the sound that was recorded when the footage was playing at regular speed would still uh, work. And then on the stage, we had to pay attention to it a couple of times. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, we had to work to uh, on the stage to, to pay attention to those things and make sure things stayed in sync. Um, so we, those were that, those kind of things, like they'll reach out ahead of time. Uh, you know, the season before that, they reached out to me. It was, very, it was actually really, really cool. They reached out to me before they even filmed it when Dee Snyder was going to do his cameo. They really wanted to make sure it was their pet peeve of mine too. When you see someone go to a concert and all you hear is the album cut off of the CD right. or the album played back with some reverb and it's clearly not live. It's clearly just the track that was recorded in the studio for the album. And so they talked to me about, it. so they reached out to D and he sent them his personal archives of live recordings wow. of the songs that they, the two songs that they were thinking of using in the show. And they let me, they, they sent me like five or six different live recordings. I got to listen to all of them and I got to listen to them to see which one had the best intimate club sound. Cause some of these recordings were in stadiums with mm -hmm. 40,000 people. So I was able to listen to them and which one had stems broken out where we had the vocals separate from the guitar separate, which one had the crowd tracks separated out. And so I was able to listen to these, these five or six versions of these two songs. And I picked the ones that were going to work best. And that's those are the ones that were played back on set that the that Dee and the uh, other actors lip synced to, and that's what we mixed on the stage. So you're actually hearing a real live performance that we were able to mix to sound like it's playing in that club to make it sound like they're really there and not that kind of you know I don't want to say cheap. Sometimes you just don't have the ability to, but just just the 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 less nuanced just mm -hmm. playing the studio track. And you know, and trying to pretend that it's live, even though you know it's exact, you know, you know it's a studio track. So they got me involved before they even filmed on that one, which was great, and it worked out perfectly, and everybody loved it because all of that attention and care was taken to to figuring those things out ahead of time and bringing in the people, bringing in the people at the end who knew what was needed to let them know at the beginning what they should do. So yeah, they do things like that, and then season five has a couple of those as well. But I I, I don't want to talk about, you know, don't want to spoil it for people. Of course, don't want to spoil it. But again, it's testament to the fact that, uh, again, collaboration with filmmakers, the directors and the sound production team um, will give the best results because it's all part of that story. Um, uh, so I, I think with that, uh, I, I'm going to let you go because I, I know you've got to get ready and you've got a busy evening ahead. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll shoot some pictures at the premiere and I'll send them to you so you can share them with your, uh, be incredible. With your fans and let them see what it's like. And, and they'll see what you'll see is the people who make the show aren't anything other than just all the people who make the show are just fans, just like everybody else. They just were crazy enough to come to LA and make a go of it as a career. Right. But all of us are just fans of film and TV and fans of this show and fans of the Karate Kid and we're just so delighted that that people are enjoying it we love it because we know how much love and effort and passion you guys give to the show and, and that's what emanates and that's why we love it so much um so uh, you know from all of us in the uk enjoy the premiere this evening give everyone our best wishes and our love and we can't wait to see the new season patrick thank you very much indeed
Hey, thank you uh, for having me on. And thank you for letting people and helping people uh, see and hear films and TVs the way they're meant to be. We really appreciate that. And you're, you're our, we're your biggest fans. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.